Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 153, and I'm here with Christine Wolf. Uh, Christine, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, I do want to start off, and I've said this to a couple other people, the fact that you're a mother of four, a mo- I would say a mom in general, and a middle school band director. You have all the praise I can give in the world, and you're one of my <laughs> superheroes. So thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. Um, a lot of people have been asking about sort of work-life balance, but more of a, how do I be a good parent and raise great children, but also be a really fantastic band director? Um, and we talked a little bit off air and I think you have some great stuff to share. So can you just say a little bit about your background with you and your husband and your kids and your programs and like, you know, information you share on that? Sure. So um, I am a junior high band director here in Utah, and my husband is also a junior high band director in the same district. Uh, his name is Heath Wolf, and he's at Farmington Junior High. And we have four children um, from adult through almost adult. And it's been um, a struggle in many ways to to be successful at home and at work. And the biggest thing that I like to tell people is that you can't be perfect at all of it, that there are going to be times when work is going to need more attention and family's going to have to take a bit of a back seat and vice versa. And so the perfect work-life balance really doesn't exist in that it's never perfect. It's, it's something that we're always striving for. And I think it's important to give yourself grace um, through all of that and know that, you know, if you're expecting perfection in both, you're never going to be happy. So, um, there's an analogy that I came across a number of years ago that I really like, and it's, um, the analogy of the people that, you know, um, are really talented at spinning plates, um, for entertainment. So we've all seen maybe a a video of someone that's spinning plates on, um, little wooden sticks and they've got, plate spinning on like all four limbs and maybe one on their hat. And the the plates are never all spinning the exact same. There's always one that's about to fall. And so the person has to give the attention to that one at that time. Um, and sometimes as a mom, we feel like we're spinning plates and they're all about to fall. And it's okay to take a moment and re-spin that plate, get it going again, and then to give your focus to the next thing that needs it. And so being organized, prioritizing time. Um, But most of all, I really feel like it's important to not look at others and go, you know, they're perfect. And what's my problem? Because the comparison game can be in everything, our biggest downfall. So, um, you know, I, I've had our kids with us from the time they were born in music, they've gone to festivals, they've gone to competitions. um, They've sat in, in bouncers um, through endless clarinet lessons. Um, they can sleep through drumline. Um, they've they've mm-hmm. been through it all. And, and there have also been times when, you know, I've gone home at the end of the day feeling like the worst parent in the world. And there've been days when I've gone home feeling like the worst band director in the world. Um, and just starting over the next day and, and trying again. So there's just not a perfect um, fit. And I always tell, um, especially young moms that are trying to go into the profession, um, that the the biggest thing they can do is talk with their spouse or their significant other and find out what's going to work for their family situation because what works for my family situation might not work for them and to find what's going to work for their situation and and go with it that way. Um, but But not to try and emulate another person and expect your family to be able to that dynamic to work exactly like someone else's. I also had somebody, um, when I, my kids were really young, like both under three, right. Mm -hmm. And you have two band director parents and you've got young kids and you're like, man, how do we, how do you do this? To me, the, the huge key that I still take away is preparation, like preparing for the next concert well before you need to having the music, you know, having lessons like, so if I have to be gone all this week, because my wife has concerts and I don't, but the kids are throwing up and I know I'm gone a week. I know the next week I'm still prepared, you know? Exactly. And you know, when our kids were little, we hired, um, we hired neighborhood girls to come over and there were sometimes a few girls in one family so they could take turns and it would be like, maybe it's 
Megan's day on Tuesday and Sarah's day on Wednesday. And they would come home or come over to our house right after school and stay until the other, my husband would get home or stay until I got home when they were really little. And then we just kept track of their hours and paid them like a little employee at the end of the month. Another thing that we did with helping with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, childcare, like when we would travel with a group is we would hire a friend of the, of the band that maybe wasn't in band. So maybe your piccolo player's best friend is not in band, but would love to go on the trip. And she was hired to be our kid's babysitter while we were involved in band related activities. But then when we could spend time with our kids, because we weren't directly doing a, a performance related thing, she got to hang out with her friends on the band trip. And um, that was always a creative way to kind of um, work out the childcare situation and still be able to take our kids maybe with us to an event. I love it. And I skipped this information. <laughs> I do want to get to it. You're the director of bands at Central Davis Junior High in Davis School District in Utah. And Correct. your your husband teaches also in Davis School District, but at what high school? Farmington, sorry, Farmington Junior High. Farmington Junior High. Yes. I got it. Great. And our oldest daughter is actually in her fourth year at uh high school also in our district. She's the head director there um, at Syracuse High School. So is she, and uh, you're speaking for her, is she like, I want to emulate mom and dad all the time? Or am I like, they they do all this wrong. I want to do, I want to do this totally <laughs> different. Like, how's that dynamic? You know, I always think someday someone's going to interview her and get the other side of the story. What was it like to have parents as band directors? And, um, you know, I think <clears throat> where my husband and I both teach junior high and she teaches high school, she's having some unique experiences but she's still, you know, it's always an open door policy and she still calls us with questions. Um, she's super smart and super capable um, and is doing amazing things at her high school. But she's kind of on her own track because she's doing high school and it's a little bit different than than what we've done, which is exclusively junior high. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, one thing I had a, I had somebody tell me when I was when my kids were much younger <laughs> about how harder how much harder it was going to get. Like, oh, you think it's hard now? Wait till yes. they're driving. Wait till they're, you know, and it's like, uh, mm -hmm. well, I'm not there yet, but like I can sit and do this podcast and my son can play with a friend downstairs and that's okay. But like, I, I want to tell people who literally have two kids or three kids under five, like, I think this might be your hardest time because the kids are need you so much. Whereas when they get a little bit older, and they can play in the neighborhood for a couple hours. And you know, you know what I mean? Like I found, oh, we've, we felt a huge weight lift when we, they can start being a little more independent. And, and I agree with that. And that's why having a, a network around you of either some neighbor girls that, or boys that can help, you know, even do a, a structured play date when they were little and that, that toddler age, and we needed to be able to get some work done. Um, we, we really hired them to be playmates and little homework buddies when they were in those um, early elementary years. But once they get older, it does get harder um, in my perspective um, because it's more expensive. It's more expensive. I mean, you think diapers are expensive. Wait till you're paying for ballet and lessons and car insurance and all these things. But it's like every time in life, it, it has its, its, bonuses and it has its negatives. And um, there were years when our kids were in high school and they were so busy. They were, they were doing all the music things and they would also be involved in their other interests. And it felt like all we did after school was take turns driving carpool to get our kids to their different areas. Um, there were even years when it felt like my kids were having to carpool via airplane you know, during the summer, getting them back and forth from different music camps across the country. And my husband and I were doing guest con conducting things. And, and, um, you know, I tell my parent, my friends, you know, I'm a great parent via phone and, uh, and thank goodness for Facebook and um, not Facebook, sorry, FaceTime, okay. and all these other ways that we can <clears throat> still have contact. But you just have to be creative and um, find ways to, to get it all done. I noticed that the minute my first child was born, I was a different teacher. Absolutely. I taught for three years before we had children. And, um, you know, coming straight out of college, I knew it all. I knew everything. I did too. I, it was awesome. I just knew everything about how to be a good parent. And why aren't these parents just making their kids practice, right? 
Um, I have so much more empathy for parents and how I approach their children after having my own. Um, especially our youngest is a boy and he's awesome. But boy, boy, do I have empathy for middle school parents of boys um, after having my own son not turn and work sometimes or, you know, not sometimes, you know, just do all the things um, that that kids do. And um, it just gave me a lot of empathy for parents and for kids and what they're they're going through. And I, I just remember, like, I went back to school after that paternity leave a couple of weeks and I went back and then I literally saw every kid in the band as someone's baby, you know, like exactly. that was, it was, it was mind blowing. And I, I wouldn't think that I was rude to the kids before, you know, I think I was pleasant and very nice, but I did not, they were just part of my band. And then I went, Oh, you know, 14, 15 years ago, cause I'm a high school teacher. This was what their parents were doing. And now they're so much further along. Well, isn't that what we want for our own kids when they're in school, that their teacher will love them and care for them and nurture them as though they were their own child? Not that not that parents sometimes aren't frustrated with their own kids. It's not like we, you know, go around and, and never get frustrated by our own kids um, because that's just life. Do. But yeah. it's it does it does require me very often to pause and remember that when it's all said and done, it's not about me as the band director. It's not about the rating on the sheet. It's about the experience that I'm providing for that child. And are they getting that in an authentic way? I love it. It's awesome. It's a great discussion. Are we, uh, is this, uh, this is like a seamless discuss discussion. We're going to go from parenting to the clarinet. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if right? there's any, any stops along the way, but. Well, at my house, it wouldn't be because when they came home from the hospital, I would always take six weeks off and then I was teaching lessons or doing something. So they have gone from being a newborn to listening to clarinet lessons. Yep. So there's our, there's our transition. <laughs> and your husband's a percussionist. Um, yes. so what did your kids play or what did your, what do your kids play? So our oldest is a flute player and that was fabulous because I made a point of going to, I, I tried every flute lesson. So it was like a, a workshop for me. Right. Right. And, um, our second was a percussionist as well. And, um, she's, um, headed to law school. So she's not doing that. And she did a lot of her lessons with some of uh, the, the local Utah symphony players, as well as my husband. And then our third played French horn. And that was great uh, because I was able to learn a lot from participating in those lessons. And then our our youngest is um, a percussionist as well. And he takes from his dad. Isn't that funny how sometimes you, like, you, they can learn from their parent, but sometimes it's like, get me away. You need a teacher. Oh, absolutely. And and I taught um, I taught my second daughter clarinet at first. And after a few weeks, we decided, yeah, she's just, she's just not a clarinetist. And so she, she, um, continued, um, with percussion, but, you know, I, like we tell our students, we don't necessarily teach them because we hope that they're all going to be professional musicians. Our oldest decided to go into music and our second is going into law and our third is going into nursing and our last child is in high school. So, Right now, he's um, enjoying all the things that are, you know, being involved in music as a senior in high school. But um, you just want to give your kids as well, your own or your students the best opportunity to become the best human beings possible through music. And, um, you know, my daughter that's going to law school doesn't play percussion anymore, but she volunteers once a week for an hour at the children's hospital and plays piano. And so she's still sharing that love of music, you know, with people that really need some softness in their, their lives. And so that's, that's really what we're hoping for when we are teaching all of these mm -hmm. kids at school, at least in my philosophy is a love of music and to learn some really great life skills through that diligent effort that is required by learning an instrument. I love that, um, that example. Cause you know, we, it, it, we, my wife and I, we follow the John Feyerabend method and, and the whole point is to make them tuneful, beatful and artful. Right. So we talk about yes. like when they have kids, can they sing their kids to sleep or, you know, when they're dancing at the wedding with their daughter, can they dance in time? You know, like those, you're absolutely right. That's what it's about. It is. And it's, isn't it so fun to meet people that you never would have thought 
had a musical bone in their body and find out that they do have at least an appreciation for the arts because mm -hmm. they've had an, a life experience with it. Can I just say something re regarding kids too and like developing them as singers when they're super young? Like a lot of people don't realize that the kids' vocal cords are so short. Like that's why isn't it always an F and G? Like those are the those are the notes that kids can yep. kind of sing between F and C and, and things like that. So when your kids are really young and you're li they're listening to music, the more you give them that is like quality it, that they can start singing along. I, I don't think it's a, a it's not a trick to get them to sing. It's just a fact. It is, and that exposure is just crucial. I my son would be my girls always practice piano before school. And um, we actually had to buy a second piano to get everyone's practice time in. And my son would be in his high chair singing canon exercises because that's what he <laughs> was hearing every morning. And so he'd be singing along with them that's on right. their playing their scale exercises. And he would be singing along from his high chair because, you know, that's what he heard. And yeah. it always made me laugh. That's awesome. Um, all right. Let's switch over to clarinet. Um, cool. So you have your presentation i saw the blog and you presented this as well it's called am i right power up taking your clarinets over the break am i yes. correct all right yeah i got that one and we're going to put the link to the blog uh in the show notes as well for anybody who wants to uh Wonderful. find it easily so the first question i had is because some people say the way i treat the break is i treat it like it's not a big deal and i just teach them the fingering and we go on so i said that and my wife went oh she was not. So the question I have for some people, for younger teachers, what is the break on clarinet? I know this is a super, a super obvious question. What's the break and why do we treat it with special care? So the break, and there's a lot of different words for it. And I might even qualify that um, the way I do things isn't the end all or be all. And there are so many different ways to teach this. This is just another one of those ways. Um, I agree with the sense that we shouldn't make too big of a deal of going over the break in the sense that it would create anxiety in the student Sure, because it is a challenging um, set of skills. And when it's not done with the right approach, it can be something that can really turn kids off of, of playing the instrument. For instance, I time this as carefully as I can to never be too close to the semester break because I don't want kids to think that they need to quit because they can't do this new thing. And when I'm talking with my um, students at the very beginning of the year and you know the flutes tend to take the longest to get a, a great sound on the head joint or on the instrument, it, it usually takes them the longest to get the whole group of them creating that great um, sound. Whereas clarinets, it may not be perfect yet, but they can make a sound mm -hmm. quite quickly. So we talk about in my classes a lot about all of the instruments. There's not one that's easier than the others. They're all going to have times in their development that are going to be challenging. Right now, the flutes have a pretty challenging situation just to get started. Whereas clarinets, it's pretty easy just to start your mouthpiece and head joint or mouthpiece and, and um, barrel, sorry. And later on, I say clarinets, you're going to have your chance later on where it's going to be a little challenging and when we're doing that with the flutes, they're going to have other challenges. So I try and make sure that students know that if they're on the right instrument, that's going to be the easiest instrument for them, quote unquote, but that every instrument has challenges so that they aren't blindsided by this thing that comes up. And when it does come up and I teach it, um, I either te approach it significantly before the semester break and then don't necessarily um, drill it really hard until after so that they don't have that natural window of giving up. Yeah. Um, that's so, so smart. So smart. I, I start it with, you know, just making sure that they, they understand that when they're doing that transition back to your original question, sorry, of going from a to B natural with all the fingers down, that is the break. Um, and that that's really tricky, especially the younger the players to get all those fingers down and sealing and working. And then I, I'm really a, a big um, fan of the growth mindset um, concept. And so I also make sure that they all know that they're not all going to find success on this at the same time, that Johnny might get it the first time. And Susie, it might take her three or four weeks or even months longer, depending on her finger size, her um, ability to control her fingers, but 
that I've never had a student not get it. We had and I a, think that's really important. We had a student many years ago who was just so small. She worked so hard and she was doing all the things, but her fingers were literally not big enough. And she yeah. just worked and worked and worked. And wouldn't you know it? She's now a fantastic middle school band director, right? Like she just had, she understood and she stuck through it. And then if she was an all-state player and, and great, her name is Rachel Williams. Shout out to Rachel. She's fantastic. And she, she kind of went through this struggle because of the, you're right. It's not only like the length of their fingers, but like literally the meat on their fingers. Sometimes for yeah. these little kids, it's hard. Yeah. And if, you know, if they're trying to play with, I'm um, sorry to put my hands right in the camera, <laughs> if they're trying to play with piano technique and, you know, not collapsing that first knuckle, like we talk about so much in piano, you know, and they're trying to seal with this part of their finger, they're yeah. not going to have success. But that also goes so far back to the beginning of the year when you're talking about hand position and making sure that they're not up on their tips of their fingers, but that yeah. they're, you know, just on that really meaty part. Mm -hmm. And I try and remind the kids that, you know, even me as a band director, and they might think, especially as a clarinet specialist, that it was never a problem for me. I was one of those kids that wasn't allowed to take their clarinet home the first week of summer band because I couldn't play whatever the required song was. You know, um, like you said, it, it, it just letting kids know that it's okay to not get it the first time. And that requires a lot of creativity from a grading standpoint and from um, a music standpoint, rewriting parts, making sure that those kids don't feel like they're less than because they haven't grasped a skill yet that's completely out of their control. Okay, so the um, the work that you're doing here, um, you have a make music playlist, which used to be smart music. I'm old enough yes. that I still call it smart music. Um, I do too. <laughs> you have it in, into five sections, and we're going to get to those sections here in a second. Um, but for anybody who doesn't have make music, you said there's a 30 day free trial kind of thing. Um, what are some resources people can access if they don't have make music? So there are a number of exercises. What you're looking for are in in any resource, and you could even write them out on your own if that's something that you felt skilled in. But they're broken into um, just exercises below middle C. So teaching students um, how to read the notes below middle C um, with good recall, the letter names and uh, where it is on the staff. And then just finding exercises that are going to take them down. I, I call it down in the basement mm -hmm. um, where they're feeling like they can play um, really confidently down there. And that needs to happen quite a bit before you try and take them over the break, in my opinion. I think that um, like way back in November, I was exploring with the kids. Oh, guess what? Okay, we've got middle C. So what if we, you know, just start adding fingers on the right hand? Um, what would that sound like? And, and reinforcing that when they're playing those notes, they need to have a big resonant sound. Sometimes I talk about how um, their fingers should kind of vibrate a little bit when they're sealing mm. it. Um, I also talk about how, especially with the right hand, when it's not sealing, we do the exercise where we squeeze the rings and then carefully hold the clarinet between our knees and our shoulder and then look at our fingers and see if we can see the little circles. And if you can't see the circles, then you're not sealing it all the way. And just doing those walking exercises where you just walk the clarinet a lot and check to see that you're sealing those are all skills that go back to just at the very beginning of the year to make sure that they're setting up for success because they won't see those if they're not sealing. Um, but other resources, um, anything down low, um, you could write it down and just having it be a nice, big, full, um, nothing too fast right. where they're having enough time to process in their head, the letter name, and this is that fingering. And here's the letter name. And this is that fingering. Um, other resources that I have found that I really like, I helped, um, Scott rush with just a little bit of the clarinet materials on the habits series for the habits of a successful beginner band musician. And if you go to habits universal, um, there are clarinet supplemental pages. And, um, I even, um, asked him to please make sure that those were available to be played in a full band situation. So even though going over the break is something that we introduce in beginning band, second year players and sometimes even third year players need those reviews. And so if you can have a, a printout sheet and those are all available free on Habits Universal under resources, um, 
there are files where you can print it out for your whole band. And so everyone's just doing a different, another long tone exercise um, while your clarinet's review going over the break. I love that. Um, and for people who are, a lot of people are just listening, not watching. Um, yeah. you, I'm just going to notate that your, your hand is flatter than it is like a C position. So we talk about using the meat of the finger. You mentioned yes. that, but I want to make sure that's what people are kind of hearing as they're, as they're listening. Perfect. Thank love you. It. Love it. One other resource, and I don't know John McAllister at all, but I have come across some of his things on his website. It's John McAllister music and everything, not everything, but almost everything on his website is free. And there is an exercise called register stretching. That is fabulous. And it's all of these exercises that are going to work on flexibility going down into the basement as well as going over the break and it's available for your clarinets as well as the the whole band and i think there's even some click track play alongs with it yeah. um that are fabulous i actually um just printed this yesterday to give to my students and i know you guys can't see it but for those of you that might be looking i went yeah. through on the page and hand wrote in all of the right hand left hand reminders and then highlighted where they need to do some um venting and putting the right hand down early um as they prep to go over the break and so those are resources that are free as well i just added um some things to it so my students didn't have to write it all in especially when they're just reviewing those materials that's great yeah john john is great i actually did a session two sessions with him on the oh. podcast. I think it's in the fifties, like 52 and 53, like back to back. Okay, I'll have to go check this uh, out. Oh, he's great. He's super nice. And all those, like those warm ups are amazing. I mean, they're really good, but like those backgrounds, like, Oh, I'm in a movie or, you know, Halloween yeah. or, they're so good. My kids love them. And, yeah. and I, I'm a, a big fan of having something that we can just kind of play down the sheet, especially, um, I, in my school district, there's only one band director per school. So having options to have warmups like that, where I can maybe turn on the play along or turn on the click track and fix a clarinet or fix a trumpet or, you know, do some of those things that have to be done when there's not another person that can do them. Um, it's, it's a great resource. So I agree. Thank you, John, for doing those. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So this is a five-step process that you have here yes. and we're going to kind of go through each one of them. So um, the first one is low note prep. The second one is high note long tones. So once the students have really gotten down um, into the basement and feel comfortable, it's it's important that you don't just start taking them over the break, back and forth, where they're going from A to B natural, A to B natural, because that's a pretty challenging technique. But for me, the next step is to have them exclusively above the break. So maybe starting with um, middle C, add the register key, creates G, and hold that out and really make sure that they know, okay, and here's where G is on the staff. And here's what it sounds like. And no, that's not a squeak. That's actually a note. Mm -hmm. um, and then adding right hand fingers in the same way that we did playing middle C down to low E and working our way down. So a lot of times I, I talk to my students, you know, they're trying to play a B natural. It's not coming out. And I'll say, okay, we'll walk it down. And maybe we'll start at C and walk it down. Or maybe we'll start on A below middle C and just walk it down from there so that they don't run out of air by mm -hmm. the time they get to low E, which is one of the big reasons why E doesn't come out. Um, I also might mention that if it's been four or five months that your students have been on the instrument and those notes aren't coming out, there's, you know, check that instrument for leaks. If it's been knocked at all, there could be reasons why those aren't coming out and it could be something mechanical with the instrument. I also um, think it's really important when the students are trying to get, especially um, over the break and getting those G's out, they've got to be on a firm enough read. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I really want my kids ideally on a three, a newer three or even a three and a half when they're trying to get those high notes so that they're in tune um, so that they have enough um, quote unquote meat on the read to get the vibrations out to make a characteristic sound on those in, on in that range. So we'll we'll do exercises that are just above the break is what I'm saying. That's what these high note exercises are. Just giving them a chance to play the high notes, get used to what it feels like to push down the register key and um, and you know the F on the back of the clarinet together, 
and make those characteristic sounds in that range. And it's important we don't rush that process, that they're they're comfortable enough down low before you start dealing. Just, yes. It's going to take a long time. Yeah. And, and I think it's okay to ex- expose your kids before they're having to read it all at the same time. You know, just say, oh, guess what? We got down to low G. I wonder what would happen if we press the register key. And then let them kind of just explore that on their own without any... Um, you know, assignments or drilling or just just as an exploratory activity. Um, and I, you know, at the same time, it's also really helpful if they know those note names before they try and play them, because there are so many things that they're trying to figure out. Um, when you think about it, when you turn that page into like, if you're using essential elements into Grenadilla gorillas, you're, you're teaching them, you know, like eight new notes in two pages. And that's not just fingering, but it's the technique of doing those fingerings and where they are on the staff and what they're called. And it's just a lot of information for these kiddos to process. And then we wonder why they're not successful. I love it. Yeah. Um, And so then after that, step three is simple high note songs. Yeah. So just, um, you know, like in, in, in the playlist, it'll have Mary had a little lamb, but it's played in the upper register without going over the break. And so just simple songs that don't have them crossing the break, but just have them. Now we're maybe trying to tongue some of those high notes and we're transitioning between notes and, you know, going through the the skills of, okay, say the note names out loud and finger it. You know, we call it airplay mode where they're just blowing air or sizzling and um, fingering it. And maybe I'm demonstrating it while they're doing that. So they're hearing good tone on that instrument in that range or playing it on your harmony director or let the flutes play while the clarinets are doing that. And then they're hearing that range, whatever it is um, so that they're getting lots of drills on that one line and then play it. Um, And then make sure that you're hearing them. I don't know. It depends on how many are in your room. Sometimes kids can pretend and never actually get a sound out and finger So make sure you're hearing them at least in small groups to make sure that everyone's actually making the sounds. Yeah. And if we just boiled all that down to really basic, you get them functional below and functional above, then the the fourth step is now we're slurring between the two. Exactly. And it's, it's in small groups. So um, for instance, like on this John McAllister sheet, um, there's a line where we're just going from A to B. And I actually was working with my clarinet class yesterday, doing it in reverse and getting them to play their B and then roll down to A, but keep the right hand down. And so sometimes taking things in reverse, sometimes we think it's actually harder for them to go up because they have to put everything down. But if we teach them in reverse, they already have their right hand down Mm -hmm. and then they just have to roll to A. And um, then you go, okay, yeah, just stay right there. And then all we have to do is add the left hand. And when you're when you're adding that um, that left hand, we need to talk about hovering over the keys. And where is your left hand pinky when you're playing A? Is it flying way out to the side, or is it lightly touching the key that it needs to press down when it's time? And if that pinky is lightly touching that key, then all of the other fingers are going to be in the right spot. And so I'll demonstrate showing them. Okay, here's my fingers flying out on A. And then I'm going to try and play B and you can hear this and I purposely make it squeak and squawk and sound terrible. And then here's if my fingers are, you know, already over the keys and my right hand's already pushed down. I just have to just slide my, you know, my, my fingers into place. Right. Um, so it, that section you just talked about, is that the over the break technique sort of your, your, yeah. Five? So that is the going over the break technique. Yep. And, um, a lot of those are done in those register leaps. Also, um, so is that what it co- what we call it in the? Yeah, I think number podcast? four, and that's where you just have like a low E, and then you just add yes. the back key, right? Those are exactly. uh, register slurs. So I would probably um, maybe even do some of those before I try and take them over the break because that's just giving them that practice of making sure that their thumb is at the correct angle. I call it at a a one o'clock or a two o'clock position, so that if it's going straight up and down. Um, it's going to have a harder time kind of doing that rock and roll motion Mm -hmm. between keeping the thumb depressed for, you know, 
the back ring on the clarinet and then adding the register key. And then also reminding them, you know, like when you play A, you just take your thumb off the back of the clarinet. You don't put it down below on the black plastic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll have kids that have had that habit and I'll just take a piece of scotch tape and roll it. So that's, you know, sticky on all sides. And I'll just put it on the back of their clarinet. And it's just a tactile reminder that if their thumb touches the tape, oh, yep, I went too low. I need to keep it up here. It's perfect. So question I have is when I do register slurs with my kids, I found a lot of times that bass clarinet players have a little bit of a harder time. Um, is that a common experience? Yes. And I think a lot of it is often because bass clarinet players are sometimes neglected in their mouthpiece selection, their reed selection, their ligature selection, and the care of the instrument. Um, it's going to be a little harder to get an over the break sound on a bass clarinet if um, they don't have, there's just a lot more area. And if any of those keys aren't sealing exactly right, then, you know, yeah. the kid could be, you know, attached to an air compressor with a lot of air and it's still not going to play. Um, and then having a great mouthpiece. Oh, and this goes to all clarinets. You know, I had a student yesterday that was playing on a mouthpiece that he just moved in and not the mouthpiece that I have all my students playing on. And he was really struggling and I handed him the right mouthpiece and all of a sudden it's like, it just popped out and he's like, this is so easy. And, and I always feel bad for those kids that have to work so much harder because they don't have the right quote unquote setup. So I'm really pretty particular about making sure my kids are transitioning to the right read at the right time and that they're on the right mouthpiece. Um, so that they have the best chance for success. So for people who want to know, like what, what, what mouthpiece, what's your secret mouthpiece? <laughs> so for me, um, and I teach at a school that isn't title one, but we're like two percentage points from being title one. So, um, a lot of my instruments are school instruments, but I use the, um, the debut mouthpiece, the Phobes debut mouthpiece, you know, the B45 is great. The five RV liar is great. Uh, those are more expensive, um, but I think um, I get great results with my beginners on the debut mouthpiece. They use a regular ligature unless it gets stepped on or broken, and then I quickly upgrade them to a better ligature. And um, I have plenty of those mouthpieces that kids can either rent from the school um, because they, they're under $50 um, or... Um, you know, I put it on my list of what the kids do need to have. And then I also have um, reads and, and I write a ton of grants to get money for all those things. Um, my my advanced kids use the um, Diodaro Reserve XO facing with a Bandoran V12 three and a half and a Rovner um, dark ligature. And for kids that don't want to buy that setup, um, just like I would rent out a French horn, I lend out those mouthpieces and explain carefully what it has to look like when it comes back or they've bought themselves a mouthpiece. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, setup is really important. So back to bass clarinet, you know, I, I like the M50s, the Van Doren M50s. Um, I do like the, the Rovner ligatures if possible. Um, you know, as far as having good bass clarinets, I know that um, I've really, I've got some really old ones. My school's 60 years old and I've got some 25 year old bass clarinets and I just try and make sure that they're getting a good tune up every year by a, a trusted, um, you know, repairman. But I also have some of the Yamahas. I have two of the nice Yamahas. And then I know that um, Eastman um, and Bakun just came out with a brand new, synthetic bass clarinet that's under two grand and it has the low C. Wow. So that's going to be really hot um, coming out. But yeah, making sure that your bass clarinets aren't ignored, that they have yeah. the right stuff to be successful. And with that and enough air, they're going to rock going over the break just like everybody else. All right. So something I was, I was, I was talking over 10 years ago with John Thompson, who was at New Trier High School um, for a long time. And he was in doing an honor band. And he told me for, um, at least at that point, they were using softer reeds for the bass clarinet so they could get the the meaty sound in the lower register. 
does that hinder them? Then is that would be a, a reason why it's harder to get over the break or and how do you balance that getting a, a good upper register, but also a, a media low register? You know, um, I do. I really like my, my bass clarinets to be on not harder than a three. Sometimes they're even on two and a half. I have also um, not had a problem with them using the Legere um, signature reads. The The bigger the read, the harder it is to get a chunk of cane that is consistent. And um, especially in middle school, it's going to be even more challenging for them to be able to discern you know, a good read plus the cost. So they might just go with the cheapest read, which is the lowest quality of cane. So I've had a lot of success with the kids um, on on the synthetic reads on my bass clarinets and on my berry saxes. Um, but definitely I use two and a half, two and a half pluses. Some of my kids are on th threes, but again, you have to have some flexibility because some kids could, can make a three sound great and others absolutely not. So having maybe a few different reads that you could try with a student and find out what helps them to be the most successful is going to be um, the best idea, but definitely not the same strength of reads on my soprano um, regular clarinets as my bass clarinets. Great question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had a couple other things sort of here that, as questions as well. Um, anything we didn't talk about sort of in that five step that, that you want to get to? No, I just think one of the big reasons that I helped um, do this podcast for Make Music was that there's not one method book that has enough information. And I kind of talked about essential elements, but even in the development of the habits book, um, when I was talking to, to Scott Rush, I said, there's just not enough in this book. So they created page 16A and 16B, which um, also is available for free on Habits Universal. And it's just two full sides of just extra exercises in going over the break. And there's just not enough attention to this skill in any method book. In fact, I was actually kind of shocked how little some of the method books even approached it. Um, it was like maybe a couple lines and then here you go, you're with the rest of the band <laughs> flying over the break. And so um, all of the kids can do it with, with enough exercises to help um, let them to grow at the pace that they need to grow. So that's what the origin of the the blog post and the specifically the curated um, playlist on smart music was to find all of those things that are on smart music, all of those lines, so that you could assign those or go through those if you had the program and have lots of um, lots of material, especially if you're not a clarinetist and you're just going, okay, my clarinets can't do any of it yet. So I need to start here or my clarinets just struggle with the actual going over the break. So we're going to spend more time here. Um, so that's, that was really the, um, the purpose of creating the blog post. Love it. Um, so question here, um, what traits do you look for in bass clarinet players or even if a kid's going to move to Contra or E flat, I don't know if you ever use those, but, um, so like, yeah, what are we looking for? So we don't, I don't use E flat in my band. And, but I do teach some private students that are in the high school level playing E flat and for E flat, they would need to have a really, really beautiful soprano clarinet um, embouchure, right? For me, and also a really great ear and a willingness to, um, to work through some of the challenges of playing E flat, um, certainly pitch, um, having to, make some modifications to having obviously a smaller mouthpiece. So an even firmer embouchure, if you can imagine from clarinet mm -hmm. <laughs> going up. And so that those would be the characteristics that I would look for in an E flat player. Um, one of the things I did recently with my bass clarinets, again, I didn't want them to be the afterthought of the clarinet section or the kids that just couldn't play their B flat clarinets very well. So I did, um, auditions for bass clarinet and I made it sound just as cool as we auditioned for saxophone at my school after kids play a semester of clarinet and so we auditioned for bass clarinet and bassoon at the same time that we auditioned for um, saxophone and so those kids didn't feel like second class citizens being moved mm -hmm. to second clarinet and I have four of the most amazing bass clarinets 
after doing that that I've ever had in my teaching career as far as um, they have big air. And I was able to, you know, choose the kids that would fit that mold the best. These kids really wanted to play that instrument. That's why they auditioned for it. So they're they're going to have that um, that interest in making that instrument sound just as good as everybody else's instrument. Yeah. So I think it's just making sure that they don't feel like, you know, an outcast. Okay, you weren't good enough. So here's a bass clarinet. Yep. I, I assume part of it is also it helps if they have bigger hands versus smaller sure. hands, you know, especially at, at different ages, it might not matter as much, but. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the bass clarinets don't have, you know, open holes. They're similar to saxophones in a lot of the, um, the build of it. So as long as they can reach the keys, yes. Um, there's, there is, you know, the, the small hole in the pad that they do need to seal, but definitely bigger hands, definitely a nice big full sound um, are things we're looking for. Um, and I, as part of the audition, I also, part of the audition is that they can play um, over the break or at least know how those skills work. Because again, I, I don't want bass clarinet players that are limited to the lower register. Yep. So let's talk about the clarinet section now. So say, you know, as a band director and you have, say a set on average clarinet section size, um, your ideal, how many first, how many seconds, how many thirds, bass clarinet, all that stuff. How do you set that up? And and do you see com flaws and and what other people do? I'm not asking you to judge other bands, but like, sure. what do people make mistakes who don't know clarinet? So for me, the biggest mistake that I see when I'm out adjudicating is probably due to not understanding what the setup is. Um, more so than instrumentation and numbers. Um, so making sure that your kids are on quality mouthpieces. I, I, I tell my students that I could give you a $10,000 clarinet and put a really bad mouthpiece on it and a really bad read with an extremely average lig ligature. And you're not going to sound a lot better than if I give you a quality, you know, plastic clarinet with a really good mouthpiece setup at this level of playing. So I'm not so much about the whole instrument being the highest as, as the first four inches, you know, yep. having a, a good mouthpiece, a good ligature, a good read. And that's going to set your students up for success on tone, on pitch, on articulation. Um, certainly embouchure is important. Um, once those things are in order, um, I think you have to look at the strengths of your group. So there are years when I have three first clarinets because maybe I don't have what, a, a superstar. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Sure. And other years I might just have two because I've got two really strong clarinets and I don't want all of that high sound. So I might move that next player to second part or third part. But I definitely like to have larger, lower sections than upper sections um, for balance. Um, and then I like to have at least two bass clarinets. Some years I've only had one. My top group is probably um, on average between 45 and 55. Um, and so two to three is usually what I like. But I also won't put more kids on bass clarinet if I don't have enough regular clarinets mm -hmm. to field the section that I want in my regular clarinet section. So Every year is a little different sure. if that is an answer to that question, but definitely um, more on the lower end. And then I also don't um, seat my kids best to worst. So when they're um, in my top group, that's the only group that we actually have first chair. Um, and I have three bands. First chair is the best player. Second chair is the second best player. And then the rest of the section is mixed up and I will, I tell the kids, I will always mix it up having strong players next to weaker players. And the last year player in any section will not be the worst player um, because they're, they're going to need to be working together. But so usually I'll put like my um, fourth best player or third best player as lead third clarinet mm -hmm. or so that there's a strong player in each part. And sometimes I'll even mix it up and make my first chairs play third because it's been a long time since they've played below middle C. 
Mm-hmm. And, and they need to remember that. Um, sometimes those second and third parts are actually a lot harder to play. Yep. Than the, than the first. So if you have 12 players say, you're probably not going to go four, 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 you'll probably be nope. like three, four, five. Wait, is my math three, four, five or two, five, five or two, four, six or something like that. Two, four, six would be awesome. If you've got two nice, strong first clarinets that can play, you know, nice in the sandbox in tune together <laughs> and not, awesome. and not overpower the rest of the clarinet section or the rest of the woodwind section. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I, I love, I love that low read sound and that low read sound, especially when you add, you know, really resonant bass clarinets and contra players, it will change the sound of your band. Okay. So uh, as we're looking at repertoire for our clarinets, when you have a strong clarinet section, what are a couple go-to pieces? I've got a few, but I want to hear what you have. So there's a piece that my uh, ensemble played a few years ago at our state MEA, and it's called Clarinet Hoedown. And it's by John Moss and it aligns with, um, it says the beginning of Essential Elements book two, I believe, but it's um, definitely something that could be played by upper level junior high bands with strong clarinet play, uh, sections and into high school. It's just a great chance for your clarinets to work on ensemble ensemble playing and, and being able to be a feature. Um, Down on the Delta has some great things by Carol Britton Chambers. Um, you know, there's 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 so many great clarinet works, and there's some things that have some clarinet solos. I think. Um, oh no, I just forgot yeah. the other name. Well, Mo- like <laughs> Molly on the Shore came to my mind. Oh you know, we're yeah, talking I grade mean, five, exactly. Of course, but, yeah. yeah, not not with my <laughs> ensemble right now, but right, you know, right. go for it if you can. Yeah, um, a couple that came to my mind. We mentioned it uh, off air too. Grade two and a half, Blue Ridge Reel. People who don't know that, I mean how how often do you play like country music with spoons and washboards and you know it's so great exactly and cut time and make them recut time yes um at grade three there's a great uh vavon williams rosa medre which a lot of people know it's in four two like how many four two band pieces are there yes well and you know a great opportunity to work on that ensemble tone and you've got Mm -hmm. there's just so many techniques that can be um taught through that piece and some of these pieces like like I wouldn't, I, I've, I bought Rosa Medre, but then the numbers weren't what I thought they were the next year. So I've had it for like a decade. I've been waiting yeah. for, a, for a large section because I don't want to do that with like six players. You know, I want to do it no. with a lot of players. No, I mean, well, and even just going back to air for band, yeah. you know, just that piece is a fabulous piece that is not necessarily featuring the clarinets, but without a great clarinet section, it's not going to work. There was one other piece I had too. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's by Schaefer Mahoney called Sparkle. It's a grade five. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. Sure. It's in the wind, wind dependence series, but it starts with, it's like flute and clarinet feature. And there's like eight measures of C major and the flutes are just crazy. Just think of the word sparkle and flute. Like that's what it is in C major. And then it goes up a half step to D flat concert and the clarinets do the same thing. It's oh, like wow. maniacal, but if they're really good and then it goes back and forth three times. Um, and then the rest of the band comes in so that if you have a great section at an upper level, that's a great piece to do. Absolutely. Or, you know, there's always wedding dance. Um, hundred oh, percent. Right. There's, there's so many great, well, especially a lot of the old transcriptions. I mean, they were creating or, um, using the clarinet as the violin of the band. And so they would take these transcriptions with these crazy clarinet part or violin parts and say, oh, well, we'll just have the clarinets do it. And I always tease my clarinets, you know, the the whole no sliding rule um, with pinky keys um, that it's not until you get to some of these really advanced pieces and or transcriptions that you get to break those rules. That's awesome. Again, thanks for spending time on a Saturday. Um, You've been at work all week. You're a busy person. I appreciate you being here. Um, Message you might want to leave, you know, people who are listening. Sure. I just think... um, you know, I'm fortunate to teach in a state where we have really positive relationships with other band directors. And even though there's competitions, it's a very supportive environment. And I just, when it's all said and done, we all have the same goals in mind. And I hope that we're all able to, um, you know, have grace with each other and and be supportive of each other. And re- remember that, you know, there's nothing in my band room that I will ever hold quote unquote copyright to um, that everything I do is 
has been borrowed or taught to me by someone that was generous enough to share. And my band room door is, is open to anyone um, to observe or, you know, decide what they don't want to do based on what I do. And I, I just, I love the supportive nature of music education. I love what it does for students. I love what we have the opportunity to do um, every day of our lives. We have the best job and the hardest job. Um, but uh, there are so many people that have great ideas. And I'm so grateful to you, Kyle, for doing this podcast so that we have another avenue to share and learn and grow from each other. Um, in my school district, we're the only band director in our school and we call ourselves singletons. And it can be isolating sometimes and feel like you're the only one that gets it. And podcasts like this um, really help us to feel less isolated and feel part of uh, a family where we can support each other and just help music education to be the best it can be for the kids that we get to teach. So if people would like to reach out to you and connect one-on-one, -on -one, what's the best, a good way to do that? Sure. Uh, you can email me at cwolf at dsdmail.net and that's Davis School District. And, you know, I'm always happy to talk band and just really grateful for what this community has done for me and my family. And I'm always looking to give back. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.